Hey, what's up developers? In this video, you are going to meet Curtis. Curtis has been in the software industry for over 25 years, quarter of a century. He's done interviewing, he's done hiring, he's worked on different teams, and currently he is the vice president of academics over at App Academy. In today's video, we're discussing whether a junior developer should be fired if they goof up. We're also talking about junior versus mid-level developers, code rot, and is Fang all that? Also be sure to stay tuned because at the end of this video, I'm going to be sharing with you how you can win a three month mentorship plan. App Academy is hooking you guys up. App Academy also sponsored this video. So shout out to them for making this all possible. When we're coding, at least for me, I, I tend to just get lost in the moment and don't think yeah. about, well, what is this going to do in 10 years? Because <laughs> this, the idea of sustainable software uh, is kind of a foreign concept in a lot of these companies where the idea mm -hmm. is to just push it out, you know, crank out the product, let's get it to production, let's get it going. Um, but the, all of these applications have an impact. And I just, I just don't see a lot of people, a lot of companies you know, mentioning sustainable practices, sustainable software, and, um, you know, building things that are going to last rather than, I, I see more of an emphasis on, well, I need this in by Friday. And then, I mean, that could be a whole different conversation talking about um, code rot and all that. But maybe we, I could ask you about that. Um, can you, can you uh, explain to people what code rot is and why it's important to build um, sustainable, well thought out programs? If you ask any software development professional who is also a manager, what is the greatest cost of the software? The immediate answer you get is maintenance, maintainability, because 80% of a software's cost is in the maintenance of that software. It's not in the initial development. It's then adding new features or fixing features that are broken. So that maintenance window can end up, like you said, being 10 years. The company that I was working at earlier when I had mentioned that I had done a four and a half year thing, we were working on we were replacing software systems that had run for over 20 years. Mm. And so running their business, running hundreds of millions of dollars, and they were 20 years old. So, I mean, when we talk about long-term software, you really have to think about that. So in just the same way, if you take an apple and you set it out on the counter, after a while, it's going to rot because you haven't done anything to preserve it. The same thing happens with software. So as we continue to add more features, there may be pieces of the code where, um, that, that fall into disuse, or even worse, end up being changed subtly in a way that we don't catch. And then that is going to introduce a bug down the road. Or, for example, we use um, an open source component, uh, whether or not it's a, a UI component like React, or it's a backend component like, um, oh, I don't know, some entity framework for, for C Sharp, for example, which is an ORM. So we're gonna use that, for example, um, and then they release a new version. And we're like, oh, we'll get around to it. We'll get around to replacing and upgrading it. And then two years later, you're on a version of the open source software that nobody uses and nobody's maintaining. So there are security holes in that. So the longer that you don't pay attention to the software that you're, that you're already having in production, when you don't give it the, the care and the upgrade paths that, that you have to do, it ends up becoming a huge liability, not only for you and your company, but also for the people who are using it. Um, for example, the Equifax breach, although we don't know exactly what it was that led to it, most people assume that it was a misconfigured Tomcat server that was running an old version. And so the, per the people who were responsible for leaking the Equifax of hundreds of, the personal information of hundreds of millions of people they got in because of code run. They were just like, oh, um, somebody, somebody somewhere said, we'll get back to upgrading that server at some point and configure it properly. We're, we're, it's just not on the road now, we're actually told. It's, we're just gonna have to wait. And, and that, that's what led to the Equifax. I, when I was in enterprise, I worked at a very interesting company. It was an IBM partner. Um, the guy had started his business in the 80s and we were on the AS400. Uh, awesome server, but uh, doesn't always work well with web development. Um, so there were just um, problems that had been, you know, just at first the application worked great, but then eventually month after month, a little tiny feature, something would slow down, something just wasn't working right. We said, 
we'll just get to it when we can. We have other, like you said, pressing issues. We just, it's just not on the timeline. Um, but then it gets to the point where stuff just completely, it comes to a grinding halt. Um, and then your client who paid a million dollars for an application is wondering, why isn't this working? Um, so it has very serious effects. And I guess, I guess I didn't realize that when I was, you know, going through the learning process. Um, so I guess my question, my follow-up question is, in a boot camp, you teach people how to learn code and how to problem solve. Um, how much, how do I phrase it? How, how much responsibility is it of the, the student to learn on the job about these problems? Like at what point should a junior developer be blamed um, for something going wrong? Um, and what point should it be? Should it be well, your textbook was wrong, or we don't do it like this? I mean, what should a what, should a junior be fired if uh, they they goof up? I guess is my question. Sometime in the last six months, I read this really great blog post from a junior developer who was hired, came on site at a company, and ended up deleting their database in production. Whoops! Okay, that's. That's serious mojo right there. That's, I mean, the company lost you know millions of dollars while they were trying to like recoup and everything. Um, that person thought that they were going to be fine. And I would say that there's there's a there is a chance. Let's just say a forty percent chance that at any random company that person would end up getting fired. But in this post that I read, it was it was really just it. It only reaffirmed my, my faith in the community of software developers that, that I don't know um, because they tend to be fairly reasonable people. Um, they said there really should not have been any way that this new hire could have deleted our database in production. There's something wrong with our systems. And so once they got the database back online from a backup, made sure everything was running properly, they did a, a root cause analysis of what happened. It was part of their CICD scripts and the way that they were doing their DevOps that allowed this person to type a command that nobody thought would ever be typed. Right. That ended up essentially erasing their entire you know, production database. So that, there, there, is, there is a difference between malice and, and naivet. And I, I really think that those things really should be taken into account. Um, there, or, or let's just say perhaps um, rascally as well, right? There are people, I know software developers who like poking the sleeping bear. It's just fun, right? I'm gonna poke that sleeping bear and see if it's gonna pop. Um, so again, I, I think there's a lot that, that has to go with intent, but, but when you do something that the processes allow you to do inadvertently, um, and, you were just following the instructions as you understood them. I don't necessarily think that you're accountable for the consequences that occur, but you absolutely have to participate in making it right. What would you say is the difference between a junior developer and a mid-level developer? Because I, I, I hear a lot or get a lot of questions about what is a mid-level? Because we always talk about junior and then senior. Okay, the senior is the one in charge and the junior is the one making mistakes. Like what... <laughs> What's the gradual ascent into senior status? The difference between, my, in my opinion, between a junior developer and a mid-level, and the only reason that I feel like I can answer this question is I've had to write job descriptions for these types of roles over my career, is that um, a junior developer um, often doesn't know the, all of the tools that they need to be able to do to write long-term maintainable software. As to your point earlier, you know, maybe, you know, we know we've taught them how to program and we've taught them how to think. We don't necessarily teach them how to unit test properly. We don't necessarily teach them how to write behavioral tests. We definitely don't teach them how to write, um, you know, test by contract. If they move into, if they get hired by Netflix and write a whole bunch of microservices. So there are gaps in the education that don't address what you would find in an employer's place, but neither would a four-year university. These are all on-the-job training things. You can't go learn um, BDD at a university. Oh, I would be really surprised if you could learn behavioral driven development at a university. It's just something that they don't care about because they're research-oriented. So there's always gonna be holes, there's always gonna be something that you learn, 
a mid-level developer, in my opinion, is somebody who's comfortable with all of these tools and the way that they express themselves so that they're building long-term maintainable software, but what they still can't um, necessarily do is think of systems as, as larger entities and how those entities would interact with each other, right? So the more familiar you become with your craft, the larger the concepts are so that you can hold in your head in terms of how systems are going to work together. And that's really, in my opinion, the progression, it's the perspective. It's the, it's the enlargement of your perspective as a software developer um, in response to the type of software that you can build that actually moves you from you know, junior to mid-level to senior to principal to architect to CTO, whatever it is that you want to do there. Um, and then also, depending on the type of company you're with, that also means you have to have or uh, cultivate some kind of leadership skills because they expect as you move up that you're also able to mentor and maybe even sometimes manage other software developers. I want to ask about App Academy in particular because with these mm -hmm. employers, I saw some pretty uh, impressive facts that a lot of people go on to Google, your Facebook, you know, these big tech companies, the Fangs. Um, what what does it take? to land in a job like that? And how, how do you identify a student who is a prime candidate for someone who can not only land a job at a FANG, but stay in the industry for more than a year or two and become that architect or become, you know, move up the ladder to, to greatness? How do you identify that and how do you foster it? If you don't mind, I'd like to push back a little bit on, on those definitions that you're giving me. Um, I, I have some, I have a really good friend. Uh, his name is Philip. And Philip is an amazing technologist. And not only that, he's an amazing human being. And I've worked with him for, or I've, I've known him for about 15 years and I've worked with him for, I don't know, maybe eight of those. But he's, just, he's just a really good person. Um, and, and he's tried on all of those roles throughout his career, but the role that he really loves is individual contributor. He loves to be in the code doing the code, working in pair programming with another person, writing some code. And so his aspiration is not to be an architect or anything like that. His aspiration is to make something happen because that's how he measures his own self-worth. And so I think that that's really the key there for every person to be able to answer to themselves. Can I derive satisfaction in the type of actions that I'm taking in my day-to-day -day job. And with software development, you have a wide variety to choose from. A lot of, I know a lot of good software developers who wanted to become managers because they really believed that the best thing that they could do was to help other people get their job done by, by managing the projects they were doing and interfacing with some sort of business leadership to keep them off the backs of the developers. And then I know other people who think, oh man, architecture is so much fun. I love using the UML and I love drawing static class diagrams and system diagrams and how we're going to talk to each other. And I love thinking about messaging patterns and how I'm going to use asynchronous messaging on, you know, something like a Kafka bus or something. Oh man, this is all so great. They love doing that. And that's designing is the thing that they really need to do. That's where they find their self. -worth. And I mean, we're all looking for how we fit in. And it's just one of those great things that software development gives us so many opportunities to fit in into different niches. All right, developers, here's what's up. If you wanna win a three month mentorship plan to App Academy Open, here's what you have to do. Number one, be subscribed to this channel. Number two, leave a comment telling me that you're interested in this mentorship plan. And what this does is that it gives you daily access to the App Academy instructors through a Slack channel. They're gonna be helping you out to answer technical questions, provide guidance as you go through App Academy Open. I will be randomly selecting a winner, so if you get a YouTube notification, be sure to read it because you may have just won the prize.